Amen. You know, I appreciate everything that's been done this morning. It's wonderful to be able to worship together and have others participate and lead and uh, to guide us to worship. And I appreciate Walt and uh, even what he pointed out as we think about the difficulties that we face in life. And, uh, you know, sometimes as Christians, we may struggle being real and even with other believers and being real at church. We struggle to admit when there is a, a, a difficulty, when there's a hardship that we're facing in life. Sometimes we struggle when there's areas that we find difficult to find answers to when we come to trials and hardships that we face. You know, today's scripture that we're going to come to in, in Luke presents an eye-opening view of who Jesus calls the greatest man to ever live. And what we do see happen in the mind of this great prophet and man, the, the person of, of John the Baptist, we see as he's going through a difficulty, as he's going through a trial, that doubts start to creep in. We see his serious situation. We see his unmet expectations leading to a growing frustration. John the Baptist is in a strange place as we come to Luke chapter 7, verse 18. Because Luke... Uh, uh, or John, I'm sorry, Luke points out how John is here and he finds himself in the prison. And so I'm going to read for us in Luke 7, and we're going to study this morning from verse 18 through 35. So I'll read that for us as you follow along. Luke 7, starting in verse 18. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to, is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? And what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. And what then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard this, and the tax collectors too, they declared God just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. And the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come, eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come, eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. Lord, we thank you so much for giving us your word. We praise you for this text of scripture that we can study today, that as we look at how John faced doubts in his own life. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand that and to apply it and to learn how we can deal with our own doubts as believers today. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good Christians don't doubt. At least that is what some people want to believe. If you've ever uh, voiced your fears and your worries, maybe somebody has told you before, oh, don't worry about that. God tells us not to worry. And by the way, don't doubt God either. He doesn't like it. <clears throat> Good Christians don't doubt. Luke 7 here, is, it's an interesting section of scripture about faith and about doubt. You know, we go from a man of, of great faith, 
uh, the centurion who uh, had this man who was healed to a, a woman uh, who, you know, he had great faith. And we come to a woman who in, in this text seems to not uh, have any faith that is displayed. And as, as her son is brought back to life, and now we come to John the Baptist, who is really struggling with faith. You know, this passage is masterfully placed by the Holy Spirit's inspiration. You know, we have a lot of things in, in regards to the confidence that we have about God and about Jesus. There are still a lot of things that we face in our lives that cause us to question things, cause us to doubt. Why is God allowing this to happen? You know, there's famous statements that we see in Scripture. We, we know the statement, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Who said that phrase? It was John. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Who said that? John. After me comes one mightier than I, of whom I cannot stoop down to untie his sandal. That was John. And finally, he must increase and I must decrease. You know, those are all famous very well-known statements that we know of in Scripture. Those were of John the Baptist. And Jesus says that those that are born of women from creation up until that time, none were greater than John the Baptist. We look up to John the Baptizer. This was the greatest man at that time, but he was a man who we see today had great doubts. This is an imperfect faith from the best of men. So we see clearly here how John is struggling with doubt. He struggles with doubt and confusion. And he is troubled in himself. Verses 18 through 23 really describe this confusion about Jesus. He's basically saying, let, let me get this straight. Is Jesus really the prophesied one? Because John had preached about Christ, and now he finds himself in prison. And so he's skeptical of whether or not he was even correct. Are you the Messiah or are you someone else? You know, as you, as you study through Luke and, uh, you know, we haven't seen Luke or we haven't seen John in, in the gospel of Luke for quite some time. He's referred to back in chapter 5, verse 33, when the Pharisees were trying to accuse Jesus of not obeying the fasting rules that they made up. But we hadn't really heard much about him since chapter 3, verse 20. You might say, well, why? Where, where has John been? Well, we see in, in Luke 3.20 that Herod had had him thrown in prison. John had simply accused Herod of immorality because he took his brother's wife as his own. And so therefore, Herod responded by locking him up. So as we try to, to understand this scene, as we start out this account, we recognize that John is locked up. He's locked up in a place called Machiris. And uh, this is the, the, remain, re, the remains of, of that palace today. It was a, an area that was kind of in a desert area, um, but it was also a, a fortress-type palace. And uh, this is where this castle dun dungeon would have been found, where uh, John the Baptist was in at this point. Now, some, some people um, estimate that this is probably the layout that it would have had at that time. Um, and, uh, and so while John was here, he's locked up in this prison, this, this dungeon. John's disciples, the people that were following him, they came and, and they report all these things to him. And that phrase, all these things, refers to the miracles that Jesus had been doing and, and the preaching he had been giving. And so you would think at this point, because of all that Jesus had been doing, John would be quite happy. He would be rejoicing in the great progress of the gospel message. But John is blinded by his situation. His situation is bleak at best. Now, for those of you who know the end of John's story, you realize it's not a good one. He'll end up becoming beheaded not too long after this account. So here we find him suffering in this dirty dungeon. He's probably hungry, thirsty at the least. He's probably facing many other struggles and pains. He's likely been in this prison for about a year at this point. And he's becoming more hopeless day by day. His expectations of Jesus being a strong judge of the world aren't being met. Things aren't working out the way that he had, <clears throat> that he had envisioned. John has been pointing people to Jesus. John 1 tells us that he even pointed his own disciples to Jesus. They had stopped following John and started following Jesus. The whole ministry of John 
was to point people to Christ, not to himself. He's pointing them to Christ, the, the Lamb of God, and as, as the judge of the wicked. He had a message of grace and judgment. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John pointed people to Christ, the promised one, the, the Savior. And now he's in prison, and his faith is beginning to shake up a little bit. Probably as he's in prison, he's wondering where the justice is. He's probably expecting that when Jesus, when the Messiah came, that he would immediately judge the wicked. He knew the kingdom of heaven was at hand, so Jesus, therefore, must have come to fix the world. And you know, that's what the Jews expected, so that's probably what John was thinking at this point. You see, they didn't understand that Jesus was prophesying two different events. Jesus came the first time as the lamb to take away the sins of the world, and that Jesus was going to come a second time to bring judgment. But to make it even more personal, John, as he's sitting there in prison, he's probably wondering, why is Jesus feasting while I'm starving here in prison? He's out healing people. He's sitting, he's eating, he's drinking, he's making friends. So John wonders, did I get this wrong? Is someone else coming? Is this truly the Messiah? Is he truly the one that's going to rescue those that are imprisoned? So John is struggling in his understanding and in his faith. Now, we have to understand that this faith that he's struggling with is, is trust. It's not any sort of a, a blind belief. You know, we all put our trust in things every single day. In fact, every time we drive across a bridge, we trust that, we'll, that it will hold up to us like it has many times before. We trust not because we have 100% proof, but because we have good evidence to believe that that bridge won't collapse. So when we think about John's doubt here, we have to understand that doubt is not the opposite of faith because unbelief is the opposite of faith. There's an author, uh, Tim Keller, and he, he talked about how the strongest form of faith is the one that has wrestled through his doubt. And he writes this, he says, a faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do will find themselves defenseless against either the experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if she has failed over the years to listen patiently to her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. You see, the strongest form of faith is one that has wrestled through those doubts. And the Bible is full of wonderful examples of people who struggled through doubt. John was fearless, but he had nagging doubts. He voiced those doubts to the Lord. Faithfulness does not prevent trials. We see that in, in lives of, of Peter and, and Job and others. John had obeyed God, yet his life ended up becoming very difficult. We in our culture today, we live in a place where people teach that, that if you please God, you will have an easy and prosperous life. There are a number of books and resources that say, if you want healing, all you have to do is have faith. If you want prosperity, have faith. Now, these beliefs beliefs are not biblical. The people of God, in fact, we recognize, if you are a believer, we recognize that as people of God, we're often faced with great hardships and difficulties. And we can trace those hardships and difficulties throughout history tied to the people of God all the way back to New Testament times. Christians have been and continue to be persecuted for their faith. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew 5. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word blessed was a familiar term for Jesus' first century audience. Rather than a fleeting happiness that was dependent on circumstances, the blessedness that Jesus spoke of is this deep, abiding, unshakable joy that's rooted in the insurance of God's blessing. Rather than feeling discouraged, dismayed, enraged, depressed, or anything that, that would tear us down, as Christians, we will find ourselves persecuted for openly living for Christ and his kingdom, and that, therefore, we should find good reason to rejoice and to be glad, for our reward is great in heaven. 
But we wonder, how does Jesus respond to John's doubts? Well, we see him begin to quote from Isaiah in verse 21. And this is a passage reminding us that the Messiah is coming. So it's interesting. Jesus doesn't scold John the Baptist. He doesn't embarrass him. And I think it's wonderful. You know, don't you love how he responds to the man here who's crying out to him from the dungeon? Well, how does Jesus respond? Well, he points John back to the assurance that he can find in Scripture. And what a wonderful truth. And friends, let me encourage you. If you are struggling with doubts, look back at God's Word. Look at Scripture. Often, we doubt God, yet we turn to our friends. And we trust them over the Lord and His Word. We understand that doubt is common. It's, it's to be expected. It comes to us when we find ourselves in darkness, when we find ourselves in isolation. It brings us down and causes confusion. So what is doubt? Well, doubt is simply a struggle to believe. Doubt can be momentarily, but it also could be continual. So many times in Scripture, we, we see doubt with believers, uh, even throughout the Gospels. In the midst of our, our belief, we can even struggle with doubt. Don't be surprised. We see it in the disciples. We see it in John the Baptist. So we have to recognize if, if they had doubts, it's understandable that we will have doubts today because we have God's entire written word today that we can look to. Have you ever dealt with spiritual doubt before? How about intellectual doubts regarding creation? Maybe gospel doubts. Maybe wondering, am I really saved? Maybe there's circumstantial doubts. Why is God allowing this trial, this difficulty into my life? Well, after Jesus has been crucified, we find even his disciples struggling with doubt in Matthew 28, where it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but yet some doubted. You see, you see, some of the apostles who saw the resurrected Savior, they even struggled with doubts. So doubt is not uncommon. John's education didn't keep him from doubting. In fact, sometimes the more that one is educated, the more we may doubt. Those who have, a, those who have biblical knowledge and biblical heritage can still struggle with doubt. In fact, there was a man who approached D.L. Moody, and he told him, he said, I've been saved for 25 years now, and I've never struggled with doubt. And so D.L. Moody responded and said, Sir, then I doubt you are really saved. You see, doubt is common, and it should be expected. And sometimes it's a good evidence and should be something that we work through as we, as we struggle through doubts, that we look back to Scripture to find answers to those doubts. Sometimes we simply need to pray, as, as it says in Mark 9, 24, Lord, I believe, but help in my unbelief. Doubt universally occurs to the scholarly and to the mature, those with much experience, as it does to the average person like you and me. Luke uses a phrase that's found nowhere else in the New Testament, but the idea is communicated in lots of places where Luke writes but it's unique to this verse alone. Verse 22 says that Jesus gives sight to the blind so that they can see, which maybe that's not a big deal, right? Uh, because Luke is quoting almost directly from Isaiah 35. But Jesus says to the crowd, today you've seen this fulfilled in your own eyes. And he says, I am what Isaiah prophesied. So John's disciples, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, are you the, the real thing or is there someone else that's going to come after you, someone else that we should be expecting. So Jesus does Isaiah 35 right in front of their own eyes. So Jesus says that he is the fulfillment of exactly what the Messiah was supposed to do. In other words, he's saying, John, you had a little bit different idea of who the Messiah is, but I am the real Messiah. I am the one that you're supposed to expect. Jesus says, blessed are those who don't turn away because of me. Those who have seen and, and their lives have been changed because of what they see in me. So he's asking Jesus who he believes in, but also who he doubts at the same time. He knows Jesus is the only one who can satisfy his doubt, but he's struggling here in a time of weakness, a time of temptation. 
But he does what all of us should do. He took his doubts to the Lord. He took them to Jesus. He knows Jesus is the only one who can satisfy his doubts. He's the only one that that can give us the answer, the only one that can resolve our doubts. In fact, going to the Lord during this time of doubt demonstrates great faith in him. But John doubted. He doubted because he was confused and and he didn't understand what was happening. When we go through personal tragedy, we tend to doubt. Think about John. He'd been in in this prison for months, probably a a year, in this stinky dungeon. He had been faithful, so he's asking, so where is the blessing? Where is God? This difficulty doesn't seem consistent with God's power. In fact, Jesus hadn't even visited him. So why is he in such a, a horrible situation? Well, John doubted God's purpose. So if you're thinking that Jesus didn't really answer the question, you might be wondering, is Jesus just avoiding these questions? And no, he's not. In fact, you lose something here in the the English translation that's very significant because Jesus does give the answer. He heals the blind and he causes the lepers to walk. Luke says he has power over the evil spirits, power over disease, power over sickness, over death. That's the kind of idea that Luke is painting here for us. There may be times like Job where he is so faithful And God says, I'm going to let my glory be seen through suffering. We know that all who live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. Oswald Chambers wrote that doubt is not always a sign that someone is wrong. It might be a sign that they are simply thinking deeply. You know, John has imperfect faith, but he also faces doubt. He is a godly man who suffered when doing right. And he voices those doubts, and he gets those back to Jesus. But it's important to to recognize and to notice here that John did not fall from the faith. And that's encouraging, because doubt does not mean that you're not a true believer, a true Christian. So as we seek to deal with our own doubts, we can be encouraged seeing John struggle with his doubt and his confusion. But the second thing that we find here as we deal with doubts is that Jesus speaks in love and understanding. This passage, like like what we find here in Luke 7, where we see one of the greatest men in biblical history experience a moment of doubt, can be quite encouraging. But what is even more encouraging still is to see how Jesus responds to him in his doubts. Because Jesus doesn't berate him. He doesn't belittle him. Jesus doesn't rebuke or reprimand him. Jesus simply loves him. He gives the man what he needs in order to overcome his doubt. John's confused, but he is answered and immediately commended by Jesus. Sure, he has this moment of doubt in prison. And we all face those doubts in our own lives. People in our church, in this local body of believers, we may battle with uh, physical issues, facing people fighting with cancer, dealing with horrible disease, There are those moments in those hard times when we say, God, is this suffering? Is this really necessary? Even the strongest of believers can struggle with doubts. We cry out to God in despair only to be reminded that he is there, he is with us, and he hears us. We have these wonderful examples in scripture where God deals gently with people as they face those doubts. And aren't you glad that he deals gently with us when we face doubts? In my own personal Bible study, I've been studying through the uh, first Peter. And Jesus commissioned Peter to feed my sheep. Peter had already been doing that throughout this letter. And then he, he seeks to, to uh, help people. So he paints this, this picture that suffering for God's will is worth it. That Christ suffered for us and he set us free from sin, enabling us to live a way that God has, has uh, empowered. And Christ is victorious. Everything in in creation, the good and the bad, is under his feet. You think of people like Noah and his family. Maybe you're like him, where you have pledged your allegiance to God, you faithfully obey him as a result, but yet you still find suffering. And Noah and his family, they suffered, but yet in the end, they were saved. And there's wonderful hope for us, too, that we have that same salvation, Let me encourage you to stay close to Jesus even through your suffering, even through your doubts because true and everlasting life can only be found in him. 1 Peter 3.17 says, It is better if God should will it 
that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. So as Jesus responds here to John in his time of affliction, we see the praise of John in verse 24, where we see that, that phrase, what did you go to the wilderness to see? We see that phrase there three, three times. So where the, the reeds get blown down, that's one of those answers. But soon the wind ceases, those reeds pop back up. And so J- John was not a reed. He is an oak. While he's affected by the wind, he's not being blown down. So what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. He's more than a prophet. There's no, no one greater than John. He was a prophet that was prophesied. And Jesus alludes to the one who was to come to prepare the way. And he's referring back to passages like Malachi 3 or Isaiah 40. In those passages, John applies them to the Lord. Isaiah 40 verse 3 says, prepare the way of the Lord. So when Jesus says that John is the object of this prophecy, he's emphasizing that John was sent to prepare the way of Jehovah. He's saying, that's me. And so we even see an evidence here of of Jesus' deity being displayed. So as Jesus reminds the people of John, we see their response in verse 29, where some repented, but yet the Pharisees were hardened. There was a clear dividing line, those who truly accepted John's message and those who did not. We recognize the same sun that shines down, the same sun that hardens the clay also melts the ice. The same message of Jesus the Messiah softens some people's hearts, but it can harden others. It happens again the day Jesus reminds them as the Pharisees harden their hearts. So John was confused about Jesus, but he's also being encouraged by Jesus. And so the third thing that we see in this passage is how Jesus scolds and challenges the people. It's interesting, we see this this phrase In verse 32, uh, where it says, they are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. So the idea here is that these Jews were never happy. Not all Jews at all times, but they were not satisfied. This music really just made no difference to them. They were not satisfied with the happy music, so then they changed the music style from being upbeat to being reflective and mourning but still the people refused to respond. So they felt like, you know what? We just can't win. The people weren't responsive either way. You know, we can, I think we can all, all can relate to this. We've been around people that are never happy. Uh, they complain about the, the temperature. They complain it's, it's too hot, so we turn the temperature down for them, and then they say it's too cold, right? Uh, every moment there's just something that's wrong, something to complain about. There are people that just won't be happy. And Jesus is saying, this is how the Jews are. They're just not satisfied with what he's he's doing here. The Pharisees were stubborn in their unbelief. Regardless of what someone said or did, they seemed closed off to God's true path. They put God in this box and they couldn't understand the different ways of God's dealings with people. This is a reminder that God's ways are not always our ways. His expectations, his plans and ways don't always align with our own understanding. So we come to verse 33, and Jesus explains what he means by all of this. John comes, eating no bread, drinking no wine, and they claim he must have a demon. So John is condemned by the Jews for his aloofness and lack of engagement as he doesn't dine with them. People think that he dresses strange. He eats strange as he eats locusts and wild honey. Uh, Back in Luke 1, it says that he has a Nazarite vow where he drinks no wine his entire life. So he comes, he has this kind of this austere look, and the people just think that he's off, he's just weird. So then Jesus comes, and he's eating and drinking, so you think the people were, were happy, but in fact, they were not. They point to Jesus who came eating and drinking, and they say, he is eating and drinking like a glutton, like a sinner. So we see here these two different contrasts. We see John being condemned, by the Jews for being too rigid. And then Jesus comes and he's condemned by the Jews for just being too normal because he ate with sinners. Was Jesus a glutton and a drunkard? Of course not. But was he a friend of sinners? Yes, he was, he is. And we praise the Lord for that fact. 
But what we see here is that some people are just determined not to believe. There are people who say, there are just too many hypocrites in church. I don't agree with this belief or that, that statement in scripture. Or they'll say the Bible is just a, a list of rules. And they can go on because their hearts are not softened to the God of the Bible. They want proof. They want verification. They just don't want to believe. In John 11, the people are pressing, asking for a sign. So Jesus responds. And Jesus goes and he gives a sign. And he raises the dead man. And still they don't believe. And and instead they go on to crucify him. You see, there are people who are just resistant to believe. But Jesus here offers his rebuke, not to John for his doubts, but instead to these religious hypocrites for their stubbornness, for their lack of belief. We have to understand that doubt is not necessarily unhealthy. It's what we do with those doubts that's important. John moved towards Jesus in the midst of his doubt, whereas the Pharisees moved away from Jesus in their doubts, and they chose to reject him. You know, this passage of scripture centers on John, but it really teaches us all about humanity. It teaches us about ourselves, but it also teaches us about Christ. Even giants of the faith will struggle with doubt. But there are answers to doubts. What do we do with doubt? Well, first off, we have to take those doubts back to the Lord. Then we look at scripture. We have to apply scripture. Doubt does not need to become denial. Instead, we should rejoice in the privilege that we have as citizens in the kingdom that have direct access to God. So act on what you know about God. To get out of our prison of doubt, we have to act on our faith. Be courageous. Be willing to seek help. Listen to the words that God provides and act on the words that he gives to us. How long are you going to stay living in your doubt? We should pray for those who are in their doubts. Pray pray for those who are skeptics, those who don't believe, those who need to have their hearts softened and find faith in God. Maybe you're here this morning and you have doubts. Maybe you've never even turned to Jesus as your Savior and you've never placed your faith and trust in him. I implore you to turn away from your doubts, to find the answers to your doubts in Scripture. Turn to Jesus As John says, he is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Are you sure about your relationship with God? Do you have doubts of where you will go, where you will spend eternity when you die? Are you at the place where you cannot live with those doubts anymore and you have to find the answers? Let me encourage you. God's word gives us all the answers to life. Whoever calls on the Lord will be saved. No one can pluck us out of his hand. He is the God who holds us fast. I like how one author put the, the, the idea of doubt, and he says that doubt is directional. We can either doubt towards God, or we can doubt away from God. So if you're struggling with doubt this morning, I encourage you to allow those doubts to drive you back to God, back to his word, and towards him. If you can't think of what to pray, pray like the great men of faith who came before us. Ask for help, ask for reassurance. God is waiting to help and to reassure us. The evidence for his existence and the truth of Christianity is plentiful. We see it all throughout God's word. We see it in human lives. We see it in creation. We don't need to be afraid of doubt. Jesus could handle the doubts and questions of of doubting Thomas, those of John the Baptist, but even more reassuring is that Jesus can handle your doubts as well. Let me encourage you to turn to him. Put your faith and trust in Jesus because he is the answer to all of our doubts. Let me ask you as we close to stand with me. We'll simply have a a time of invitation. Just a moment for you to reflect on God's word and as you apply it to your own heart, a time to pray, time to ask the Lord to help you in the midst of your doubts. If you're not facing any doubts this morning, let me encourage you to pray for those who are doubting. Maybe there are those in this room who have their doubts about Christ, about salvation. Let's pray for those folks as well. But Dan's going to play the piano. Just uh, We're going to have a moment for you to pray, to respond. If you'd like to, to get any counsel, if you want help in those doubts, you're always welcome to come forward even now or later on to, to catch me or someone else. 
Because God gives us the answers to our doubts. So let's take those doubts to the Lord right now in a time of silent prayer. Thank you.